Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mark's Backyard Birds, another edition of Thursday Live. Uh, this being the May Wild Bird update and uh, doing these, uh, getting in a good rhythm now, of the, uh, getting one of these per month to kind of let you know what's going on in the wild bird world. And this being the month of May for for us bird watchers out there, I, uh, May is probably the single most exciting month in uh, in, in the wild bird world, we look forward to every year uh, when May comes around. I've had friends in the past who took uh, at least a week's vacation at the first of May every year, uh, sometimes even two weeks to just dedicate to nothing but bird watching um, here in the Kansas City area because of the migration coming through. So tonight, uh, we always try to give people a little bit of time to get on, but we want to kind of preview what we're going to be talking about. Uh, the uh, Mainly in May, we're talking about nesting and migration because that is a hotbed of what's going on. We have a lot of birds that are well in the nesting. We have birds that are just arriving. We have birds that are passing through. So we're going to be uh, covering those topics. And remember, uh, I am Mark McKellar, owner of the Backyard Bird Center in Kansas City, Missouri. I'm a wildlife biologist by education and trade uh, over the last 35, now go really close to 40 years uh, and we're here in Kansas City. So when we're talking about uh, what we're, what's going on, like always, I want to put this up front because remember where you are, because I know you guys chime in from all over and we, uh, you guys may be south of us. So some things that I've talked about might already have happened in your area, several people to the north of us. And then we have a few people that chime in, you know, east and west and all over. So, you know, you, you just know where I am. And so when I kind of default to what uh, a date or, you know, what's going through that's I'm, I'm really talking about our area and you kind of have to give yourself a week or two or, or, or take away a week or two. Hey, Steve, good evening. How are you? Uh, I just uh, shipped you out to, uh, some soot plugs today uh, to South Alabama. Uh, Steve says, hi, Melanie. Uh, I, not only do we have, I have producer Melanie over there. I actually have uh, uh, my lighting and makeup specialist here with me tonight. Uh, this is my daughter is visiting in from North Carolina and she's sitting on the other side of the, the, the monitor here. And she got the lighting changed a bit this week. So hopefully it looks good. We're trying to, you know, every week we try to, uh, to make improvements to it. All right, Daryl from Rhode Island. Hello. Uh, oh, you and your okay. So you're it's your granddad that I know he's uh, I, I usually joins in. He said you're quite a birder, Daryl. Uh, that's excellent to hear. All right, so we uh, uh, we had a bird hike this morning um, at the Martha Lafee Thompson Nature Sanctuary, which I was a director of that facility back. Oh, what the mid nineties, and and uh, it, so it plays this near and dear to my heart, and we do bird hikes every Thursday morning in April and May. And we had quite a hike. We had 25 people, which is a, a very large group of bird watchers to manage when you're out there. But I think we ended up with 47 species today. So we had the warblers. Everything's late. I mean, and I'm, I want to poll you guys tonight and, and ask you what you're seeing and hearing out where you're at. Uh, obviously, the timing of everything. Um, hi, Ruth. Music. How are you from Lacine, Kansas? Not too far away. Uh, Pinky Love from California. So a West Coast person. Great. Uh, welcome in. Jen, hi. Uh, from up in Maine. I, I love the way we get the four corners all around covered here. That's awesome. Uh, well, Ruth Simmons. Now, I know that name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it, we've been friends for many, many years, and she is an incredible birder. Um, hello from the bird family. So, oh, there's Morgan. There's my daughter chiming in. Okay. All right. So yeah, we're giving ch people a uh, chance to get on and, and welcoming everybody in. And I think tonight we're going to get lots of questions from you guys, uh, uh, because I hopefully get some responses because I'm curious and, and I know Ruth is curious and we all are uh, kind of what is going on this spring. It has been, uh, uh, unlike any spring I've ever seen, you know, I, I've been here 32 years in the Kansas City region, and I have never seen uh, a migration that appears to be this late. Um, we the the bird right now, uh, you know, that that a lot of people are asking about is this guy right here, and you know, we're going to talk about him in a little while. But this is an indigo bunting, a male indigo bunting, and I haven't heard a single one this spring. 
And, you know, and, and typically uh, 10 years ago, I wouldn't have even thought that much about that. I mean, some we used to say the first week of, of May, uh, but in the last 10 years, especially they've, they've been earlier and earlier and uh, more the third week of April, we start hearing them singing and uh, the, the place where we were bird watching today, we, uh, there, there's usually several uh, birds nest uh, indigo bunting singing around the prairie uh, at this nature center and uh, around the edges. Uh, we didn't hear a single one, which is highly unusual. So, and, and uh, you know, it, it's hard to explain, but we are really um, uh, concerned about how late it is. But there was a person on the hike this morning who has a friend in Arizona, and she was saying that, talking to her friend in Arizona, that they're saying the same thing out there, that the, the migration seems to be really late. Now, you know, I, I don't know. Let's see. Bird lover from Northern California. And let's see. G from Woodstock, Illinois. Welcome in. G, G is that G? Um Steve says, excellent uh, lighting and makeup work, Morgan. Thank you oh, so much. you're very welcome. All right. Uh, hi, Shirley. Going in from San Antonio. We just shipped you out a package yesterday. So you guys, you're hearing me say this. Uh, people are uh, really trying to support us, and we really appreciate that on our back on our online store, shopbackyardbirdcenter.com. And we're trying to add stuff uh, uh, very quickly. What I told, I've talked about my computer conversion that we're going through right now. And once we get that on, we're going to have more on the uh, online store. So we really appreciate that help, guys. Uh, you know that we will. We try to be very competitive. Um, we, you know, like I said, we try to ship shipping rates. We try to be as competitive as we possibly can. So thanks for that that support, bird lover. I've seen several hooded Orioles recently. Okay, yeah, it that is, of course is more of a west southwestern bird. So it's good to know they're coming in. Um, Ryan from West Haven, Arkansas, and said, Bobby Muhammad, hello from Colorado. We had a Colorado person in, saw my first black chin today. Do you live in the south part of Colorado? I'm just curious, kind of the drier area where, for a, a black chin, I would think. But So, you know, I, I posted this today that no one at our store who works at our store has had a hummingbird or an oriole yet at their feeders. And I mean, we've had them buzz by here in the yard, um, but it has just been incredibly scarce. Uh, Dennis, who used to work for me uh, and, and is retired now, he is uh, saying uh, that he just this morning had a, his first hummingbird and his first Oriole today, this morning uh, in his yard. So we are... You know, like I said, everybody's just chomping at the bit. What is going on? We're, and we have faith they're going to come in. Uh, one of the things about the wind patterns this week is that, uh, that we're going to get some warmer days. We're going to get some south wind, which, again, these small birds, they can't fly against a headwind. So we have had a lot of north wind. And that's what we have to, uh, the conclusion we have to come to is that the winds have just not been favorable for a lot of these southern migrants to get brought up into the area. Now, there's scattered birds everywhere. I'm not saying that they're not. There, there are some sightings here. And I know that up in Chicago, I've got to see that there's Oriole sightings up there, and and but they're scattered. There's just not like, you know, that we're normally seeing. So, all right. Hi, Dave, David from Rhode Island, a regular. Everyone remembers to help the algorithm and hit like. Thank you. It really helps. Uh, absolutely. And Bobby, yes, Colorado Springs. Yep, yeah, I would think that'd be more where the the black chins are down your way. Yeah, brown, Steve, you're killing me with your brown headed nut hatches. I love those little guys. We just uh, we just do not uh, you know here in Missouri they were totally extirpated um, from our state because they cut all the pines uh, a, a hundred years ago. But they uh, the Missouri Department of Conservation just started uh, reintroducing some into the south, the south Missouri. But up here, we were always a prairie, never had them. But I grew up with the little brown head nut hatches in North Carolina. I love them. They're so tiny and these squeaky toys. <laughs> they're, they're great birds. Bobby had his first ruby throated hummingbird. Uh, yep. Okay, excellent. Out in Colorado Springs. I've got tons of Orioles going through lots of jelly. And Ryan, where are you? I did say you are in Arkansas. Okay, so that's a good sign uh, that you're you're getting a bunch of them down there because uh, hopefully that means with the good south wind, we'll get a bunch of them. Here's what we fear as bird watchers uh, in springs like this. So 
the longer the north winds keep these birds south and then they, they you know they can't fly against that wind uh and they stay and they get build up and they get build up down in texas arkansas and, and those southern states and as soon as the winds shift out of the south and we have a really a couple of really strong nights or three strong nights of, of uh, strong south wind a lot of times this birds just get pushed right over us i mean it just you know, and, and they, they, they pass us by and we hate that. And as bird watchers, we want the chance to get out and see these beautiful birds here. And, and some, and that takes kind of a mixture of South wind to bring them up and then North wind to lock them in for a few days and then South wind to think. And of course they have to refuel and, and regain weight and for the next leg of the journey and all. So uh, yeah, this is, uh, it, it's just really late. Hey, surely it's, Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Melanie had uh, you guys had a conversation, I know. All right, have been quite pleasantly surprised to see a hermit thrush. Oh, yeah, nice. Oh, they have the most beautiful songs. Um, and if you think now have never seen them before, hermit that whole group of thrushes. Um, and, and of course, we're going to talk about the, them tonight a little bit with the, the migration. Uh, talk of this. I'm going to go ahead and put him up here because it's such a beautiful bird. This is a wood thrush, which in my opinion, that's my favorite bird song uh, of all uh, that we get to hear regularly here in, in Missouri. The wood thrush is an absolutely gorgeous song, um, but the hermit thrush <laughs> is a, a beautiful song as well, but we just don't get to hear them sing. They, they're here in the winter, uh, but they really start pulling out now. We can still see a hermit thrush here in the Kansas City region, but most of them have already moved north and west and gotten out of here. But I don't blame you. That is a beautiful bird. I've had three to four hummingbirds at my feeder. Also had a one Baltimore Oriole. I got one of the three in one feeders. Good. Sure excellent. And for, yeah, excellent. The house finches are loving the grape jelly. Uh, and the, uh, that is the house finches are what I have seen on our jelly. Uh, we keep checking it. And Melanie's, you know, works from home a lot with her accounting work. And so she keeps checking the Oriole feeders. And, and right now it's been pretty much all uh, house finches at this point. So patiently waiting for hummingbirds and Orioles up here in Maine. Yes. You guys, Rhode Island, Maine, you still have a little wait. Although the East coast does tend to get a little spring migration earlier than we do here out in the middle of the country. Uh, it's because they've got so much good habitat. They can travel up through from, from the Gulf and the Caribbean and those, uh, those birds that migrate up through there. And, and so it, you, when you look at the migration maps, you guys are typically ahead of us a little bit. Whereas here in the heart of the country, these birds, when they're migrating, they have to uh, fly across such large open areas, they, the, the prairies uh, and the farm fields and things. They, they don't have, they'll come up the Mississippi River sometimes, you know, a, a little bit earlier. Um, but, uh, you know, I, sometimes our, we, we do lag behind and then maybe that's a, a bit of what's going on here. So, hi, Dana. Yep, Trimble, the old uh, Trimble area, which is uh, Smithville Lake is one of our favorite places to bird watching. And Trimble is up there on Smithville Lake here in the Kansas City region. You have a hummingbird. Good. And that, that's what, and had for a week or so, but no Orioles. Again, here we go. This is what we're hearing, and this is what we're seeing, which is kind of crazy. So again, you know, everybody's kind of you know, got time to get in, and I'm glad we're getting some input on the, on the migration uh, status where you're at. So I'm going to start back and go back to you know, kind of what I had planned first and just talk about nesting. Uh, because there's a lot of different um, uh, states of nesting in, in, right now. And this is a bluebird nest, uh, a, a group of babies. And we are, uh, our bluebirds here are in various states of their their first nesting. We have um, bird, uh, the birds that are just eggs that are just hatching for some people. We have some that are, you know, a few days a few days old. And then Kurt, who was on our hike this morning, he says his, his young ones are just about the fledge. So he, they, they've already, you know, uh, an incubated, he, he uh, buys lots of meal, lots of live mealworms at the store and he feeds. So he's got a real dependable source of insects for those uh, adults to feed those babies. And so those bird, his babies are growing really fast and they're about ready to leave. They're about ready to leave the nest. Uh, I had a question on the internet a oh, day or two ago about, uh, I'm not sure, maybe was it South Carolina somewhere where their babies had uh, already fledged and she was seeing the adults checking out a different box in her yard 
uh, and that's very common. Uh, you, you know, you've got nest boxes. You can have multiple nest boxes in your yard. But remember, it's good instincts to not stay in one place too long uh, in nesting because your chances of being discovered by a predator, a black rat snake or a raccoon, things like that, increase the longer you stay in one place. So the, uh, the bluebirds will tend to nest in one box in April, the early nesting. And then the second is if there's an, another uh, box available to them or a, a knot hole in a tree or a natural cavity somewhere, they'll tend to move to that second spot up. You've heard me probably say that my box is not really popular in the early nesting and that April nesting because it gets a lot of morning shade uh, for just to, from our house and trees. And so that becomes a very popular box in June or August. Whenever the, the sun's more intense and it's a lot hotter, they like that morning shade, uh, but at this time of year. So move, the, these, the blueberries will move around. Um, it is a dilemma for some people because you would love to put two bluebird houses pretty close together, but you're not going to get two pairs of, of bluebirds and nests that close together. A lot of competition between the males, a lot of chasing, and uh, uh, you may get the bluebirds nest in one of those boxes, but usually not in the other. Maybe a tree swallow in the other box or chickadees in the other box. But that second nesting of the bluebirds, it will typically select another hole nearby, and they may come back to the original box again. But no matter what, remember, you have to clean out that nesting material. The, uh, the bluebirds will not reuse that grass in that nest. So she'll just build a whole new nest on top of that old nest. So remember to clean that nest out because the day those babies leave that nest, they're not coming back. So they're, they're, you're safe to go out there and pull out that. And of course, it's, it's good to, to make sure it's clean, make sure there's not any feather lice or ants or anything like that in the box, uh, which are negative uh, uh, can impact those babies. So clean all that nesting material out uh, and, and she'll build it back from scratch. And that's fine. That's what you want to happen there. So uh, bluebirds are you know, obviously a huge topic. We've been doing this for months now. And, and, and I know how much you guys love your bluebirds. And we always want to talk about them and kind of give you updates. But remember that uh, it, where we're at, we usually get three nestings per season. Uh, Steve, down there in Alabama, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if you had four nestings per season down there. And then maybe up, you guys up in Wisconsin and Minnesota that can chime in. Uh, if they get two in, you know, that wouldn't surprise me. And, they, and in here, uh, in our area, if we had a really mild, uh, longer fall, uh, like, some of the bluebirds will squeeze in a fourth nesting uh, in the Kansas City region. It can happen. So it's always worth, to be, you know, be good landlords, clean those boxes out after each nesting. And then that last one, the one that, that in, in, you know, September or so, uh, or late August, I'll tend to leave that nesting material in all the winter for them in case they want to roost in that box. And then I'll clean that out in February at the start of the season is kind of my rule of thumb. So all right. Great resources you shared in another video, Journey North and Birdcast. Absolutely. Thank you uh, for the no lights out. Uh, uh, absolutely. I wasn't aware of that before. Thanks, Bobby. Yeah. that And again, that, that's a, another good point. Like it, you brought up, this is the time of year, April and May, we ask you to turn out all your outside lights. Uh, if you work in a business in the city, uh, if you have any influence to uh, at least tell them to leave their lights, uh, turn their lights out at night in the buildings uh, when birds are migrating and they almost uh, all songbirds migrate at night, almost all of them. Um, and, and especially on low cloud cover nights and, and rainy nights, those lights are very disorienting for birds. And that's when we get a lot of building crashes, window crashes. Um, it, it, the, we know that lights impact them. So, uh, you know, there's a big lights out campaign uh, uh, from Audubon and all bird conservation groups to try to encourage, you know, turning your lights out in the migration seasons, especially which are April, May, and then again in September and October. Um, so thank you for reminding me of that, Bobby. That's a, a great, and that, you know, the, uh, the bird cast, that's an amazing resource that, uh, uh, the bird, and I can put that link again in the description uh, this time too, because if you check that Birdcast uh, website, and it is showing you the migration and and and, and the, the the number, you know, if it's a light migration night or a heavy migration night, um, and again for bird watchers, they love that because they want to get out the next morning if a from an, a heavy migration night to try to see those birds that are coming in and through. So glad you like that resource for sure. Well, bluebirds aren't the only things nesting right now. Uh, this is a, an American robin. Uh, I like this picture because 
people, if you're like me, you've had robin's nest just about everywhere. We had one nest on our daughter's windowsill many years ago, and like I said, she loved to come in every after school every day, and she'd pull the blinds back real carefully and check on the nest and the eggs and mom sitting there and everything. It was great. Uh, but th- this is what you know. This kind of simulates a a windowsill for them. So uh, nesting platforms like this. Uh, it can be great for for ro- American robins. Eastern Phoebes will use this kind of a, a nest structure as well. They're not cavity nesters, so they're not going to go inside of a nest box. But you can get them to nest in the, like a net nest platform like this. So you know we, we've had you know, we get not they nest in gazebos up on uh, the shelves, and and then I, I, we had one nest in a we had a, a you know a swing set in the in the backyard and they had them nest up in there they'll nest you know in places like that but they need that flat surface cuz they use the, the mud and uh and the, the create that hard bottom to their nest and then the sticks around it so uh, the robins are again nesting like crazy now uh, one of the most popular birds, of course, the hummingbirds are just starting to to really get here. Uh, but I, I get asked a lot about what does a hummingbird nest look like and how big is a hummingbird nest? So this picture is wonderful um, that it was taken a few years ago here in Kansas City and they build their nest out of spider webs and lichen. Uh, so they pull the lichens off the sides of the trees and they, they create this nest and it is small. Uh, you know, their, their eggs are about the size of a jelly belly uh, very tiny, uh, small eggs, and she usually lays two and sometimes three. Uh, but they, they're you know they they love streams, and this is ruby throated hummingbirds. I know you guys are getting you know, all over. You got had the black chin hummingbirds, and uh, depending on where you're, Anna's hummingbirds out west, and Calliope hunting hummingbirds up in the northwest, and you know there's there's many different species, but all of their nests are small. The story I love to tell is many years ago, the first time I went to Arizona. I was visiting a friend of mine out there who had whose cousin had lived there his whole life. And he said, come here, I want to show you this hummingbird nest. And we walked out in his backyard and he had a wind chime in his backyard. And the wind chime were like leaves. They, they're kind of, and there was a, a black chin hummingbird built a nest on top of the wind chime pedal. <laughs> it was amazing how small it was, but they, you know, they, they'll nest in all kinds of places, but please, don't support <laughs> hummingbird houses, which I see are for sale on the internet. That is a complete fallacy. And that is somebody making money off of people who are, you know, they don't know better. We, that's why we, you know, what we do, we try to educate you. Uh, and I, every time I see that, those ads with this hummingbird superimposed on this silly acorn looking thing with a hole in it and making people think that hummingbirds nest inside of that uh, cavities and they just don't do that. So, um, but they're, you know, they're making money. So they, they put it out there and they make you believe things like that. So, uh, but hummingbirds are just getting started. They're in the nest building. The ones that are arriving here again, we're still waiting. Um, and you've, you know, I've got programs out there about their whole mating system, uh, how the male defends a resource that on your feeder, and that's what you want. And the females come in, and and uh, he chases them away and flirts with them, and all that. So that that's a complete program into itself. But uh, those females, uh, he'll have seven, eight, nine females out there around that that he is uh, mated with, and they do the nest building. They raise the babies. He doesn't do anything. Um, but they're just getting started. Um, another nest that you don't, or it's not nesting, you think about it, you can get a nest in a nest box. This is a, a red phase eastern screech owl, a friend of mine had here cl- really close to the store. Um, she put this owl box up uh, right inside her tree line. So not out in the open, but just a, a row in the trees in her backyard. And sure enough, these uh, the screech owls moved into that box um, and they raised a, a brood out of that. And it's really, really cool. Uh, they... There are screech owls like this. They're very small. They're only, I'm trying to get to the camera, but only about this big. Um, Let me get this on here. So screech owl adults are about this big. And when people see them, they think, oh, it's a baby great horned owl because they have the tufts that make you think of a great, the big great horned owl. But no, this is as big as the owl gets. This is, this is a fully adult owl. And we are going to, Melanie and I have got to find, um, a video that she shot years ago while Morgan was a really little baby. Um, we had, she had a, 
these screech owls fly in at our backyard at the Martha Lafitte Nature Sanctuary where we were today. Um, and the three owlets landed on the limb and she was able to grab the video camera and hold it while uh, you know they were out there and she got footage of the adults coming in and stuffing bugs in the, the babies. And every time the, uh, the adults would come, uh, that was coming, the three little babies would start stepping up and down and get all excited on the limb. And then the, the adult would land and they would all beg and, you know, she'd stuff a bug in and fly off again. And they'd sit there real quiet for a while. And then all of a sudden they'd start patting up and down. You knew that the mom was coming back. We, we have that video somewhere and we've got to find it so we can get it out there for people to watch. So uh, it's in the archives of Morgan baby videos. Uh, so we'll get that out one day, but you can uh, put up a, an owl box and they uh, and, and and possibly have the little screech owl's nest in there. They mainly eat insects. In the winter, they eat mice and they make small birds. They can catch birds at night on the roost sometimes. But for the most part, they eat larger insects. Um, and you know they can eat snakes. They, they they're incredible little little uh, predators. So um, that's another nesting bird that that you can attract in your yard. So worth putting up a box for and give them that to it. It's the same size box if you want to try to attract American kestrels. It's actually the same box, same size opening. If you put it out in the wide open on the side of a building or on the side, uh, uh, you know, the Iowa Department of Natural Resources mounts them on the back of highway signs. And uh, they've had really success with the, the American kestrels nesting in them on the back of highway signs. So something you don't think about then every day. So nesting. Full-blown chickadees are, already have babies. Uh, we saw uh, one begging an adult today. Uh, cardinals are, are right at having their first their first broods in, here in this area. So nesting is, is moving along, and those migrants that are coming in are just starting the process. Um, but there are still a lot of migrants yet to arrive. And we have we uh, this indigo bunting. You know, I talked about it at the beginning. If you guys were late coming in, we're, we're kind of – where in the world are the indigo buntings? They're just really late this year, but as a truly beautiful bird, it can be attracted to your, your feeders um, with millet or uh, sunflower seeds or uh, just about anything. But they, in my yard, they tend to feed with the finches. So you'll look out and you'll see on your finch feeder, yellow, 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 blue, <laughs> and it is gorgeous blue. Just uh, And uh, they'll eat Niger, they'll eat, uh, but mainly they think they like chip, uh, sunflower chips, um, millet seeds and just regular black hole sunflower. Some they'll sometimes they're on the ground around there, but they're uh, they don't last very long at a feeder. They tend to start eating insects quickly when they get here and uh, start nesting. But uh, hopefully they'll be coming in here in the next week or so. All right. David says the uh, chickadee update: eight eggs. Wow. <laughs> One week and is and mom is keeping them. Warm and dad is frequently dropping off tiny green inchworms. Hey, that's their favorite foods. Absolutely. Gary's post right before. Okay. Gary Droogie. Here's he's like you're Gary's local here in Kansas City. He had a Hummer today for the first time in the spring. That's excellent. I, I, I so hope we're going to start hearing more of these reports here in the next week or so. And hopefully we'll get ours. I keep changing the nectar to make it sure it's fresh. Um, so we are, like I said, we are eagerly awaiting their return. Okay. Roscoe says no rubies yet in Southern New Hampshire have uh, Eastern toeies grant, yep, ground feeding and y'all are on warblers. All right. On the suitcase. So uh, those are two early birds. Uh, the a toeies, we had three today on our hike uh, and uh, we had yellow rumps today. So those, both of those Roscoe are some of those early wave of migrants are just starting to arrive. So that tells you that you're, 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 it's happening. You know, they're just starting to get there and the, the diversity and the numbers will just you know, keep increasing. So that's, that's good to hear as well. So hopefully they, the, the Orioles and the hummingbirds are not very far behind. All right. So some of the, I, I, I just wanted to uh, I let you, and for those of you who are not bird watcher, you know, like go out in the field bird watching. And that's always been a goal of mine, of course, is to get people to get out past their yards or, or really look in their yards deeper and then, you know, go take bird hikes and things like that and join groups like ours um, and, and get exposed to some of these these birds that are just stunningly beautiful. This is a, a male scarlet tanager. 
And I think my cover bird for tonight was uh, uh, the summer tanager. Uh, but these are two just absolutely beautiful birds. They're related to the cardinals uh, in that group, but they have very different bills. Uh, they also, uh, they can, I, I've never personally seen a, a scarlet on my jelly, but uh, I get summer tanagers on my jelly a lot. And I had get sp scattered reports of people that have a, a scarlet tanager come in and eat some jelly. And also on suet, I've had them, uh, people have them on that. But this is one of the most beautiful birds you're ever going to see. I, this is not cardinal red, folks. This is beyond cardinal red. This is just glowing red and black. It's a beautiful, beautiful bird. It's worth getting out looking for. And they're just, again, starting to arrive here. Um, and, and, and out east, they're probably already in a lot of the, the forested areas moving up east, up north. And I would imagine you get them up in, in Maine and, and uh, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island, all those states would, should get the scarlet tanagers. So Anne says, no hummingbirds that I have seen in Pike Creek, Delaware. Bluebirds should be fledging this weekend. Excellent. You got five babies. Excellent. Absolutely. Nope. Yep. Again, again, that, that I really think, I don't know, Anna, is that normal for you not to have hummingbirds by now? Uh, because I still think you guys are as late as we are. So that's, uh, that's what it sounds like to me. So how do you attract uh, tan the, the tanagers? What, what I do, like they usually come to my jelly. So when the Orioles are in town, the, the summer tanagers especially are the second most common birds at my jelly in my yard. Uh, they nest in the woods back behind my house that the summer tanagers do. So oranges, orange slices, citrus, uh, and also the grape jelly in the spring. You, it, it, tanagers are not a bird that are going to come to feeders uh, a long time. Uh, they're mainly when they get back uh, in in the early spring, they you know they they come for that hit of energy, and then once they get set up on territories and get a good source of insects, uh, then we tend to not see them much. I hear them back in the woods. I know they're nesting back there, but they don't come to the jelly very much after that. Maybe they come and hit get a hit of orange or something like that, but uh, it, it their attraction at feeders is really that that uh, early part of spring, which will be the last, typically the last of April, the first week of May, and maybe even a little bit more into May, but. Saw one gross beak, is that right? I, I believe called eating safflower, white, yep. And black with a red breast. Yes, res rose-breasted gross beak. And um, I'm not sure if it's unusual not to see hummers here my second year in this area. Okay, yep. So you're uh, it, it, the new normal for you, you're just getting into that area. So the rose breast of gross beaks, did I, um, didn't I do a program on gross beaks? <laughs> I think I just uh, posted it, uh, just recently, uh, the gross beaks of uh, North America. Um, and it, it, I covered the rose breast of gross beak and out west, the black headed gross beak. If you haven't watched that video, you might want to. The gross beaks are a beautiful group of birds. Uh, and they certainly fit right in here with, with these migrants that are coming in that should be out looking for right now. Um, for you guys out west, I want to get this guy in here. Uh, this is the western tanager. Uh, beautiful, beautiful bird. We rarely, rarely, rarely see these in, in, out here in uh, points east, but you guys in Colorado and uh, Oregon and Washington, this is your tanager that is just absolutely stunningly beautiful bird. Uh, bright, bright yellow, uh, orange face and head and the black wings. And I'm assuming I, I would expect them to come to oranges and uh, jelly as well. I had a friend here in Kansas City who uh, it's been several years ago now. Um, she, they had one show up with the uh, summer tanagers and the Orioles one year on her deck uh, eating oranges. And it looked out there and there was a Western tanager among them. She got a quick picture of it. Um, it's one of the very few uh, documented Western tanagers in the state of Missouri. So you guys out West are very lucky uh, to, to get to see this bird all during the nesting season. Um, and then uh, the Holy Grail of, for bird watchers is this group. And uh, those, and these are the warblers. Hey, Shirley, how often do I need to change jelly? I It's a lot of just how you feel about it. Um, I, I try to keep it fresh. And once the Orioles are, and the Tanagers and those guys are hitting the jelly, you, you're going to have to be refilling it you know, during that period. But um, I should probably go out and refill mine. Um, I try to make sure every three to four days, uh, to make sure there's fresh out there. I don't, again, just like the Hummers, I don't put very much out in the early spring because I know it's going to take a while for, for them to discover it. But once they're coming, 
they'll eat every bit of it. So I have people who fill their jelly feeders two and three times a day. Um, they have, uh, a, a, they start with a little bit and then they'll add uh, feeders just for jelly. That's how much they go through. Uh, and it, it just depends on your yard. It just depends on the activity. And I've always said it really depends on the state of blooming uh, the flowers and the na natural nectar sources uh, when they arrive. If, 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 you know, if they come in and there's tons of natural flowers for them to feed on, they'll eat on the petals and also eat the nectar out of there and they'll also eat the bugs. Then they're not going to hit feeders as heavily because they've got those natural sources um, of food as well. So um, I, it, it, my saying is all, if it's good for the bird watcher, it's usually bad for the birds. So if you've got tons of Orioles coming to your bird feeders, it usually means something in nature is wrong, meaning that uh, maybe a, a freeze killed the blossoms. Or, and, and so when the Orioles got here, they didn't have as much natural food. But if, you, if, if, they're, if they're lightly coming or if they're kind of normally coming, then it usually means they're, they're getting the, what they need in nature and they're subsidizing on your bird feeders. All, bird feeders only is provide 15% or less of your daily diet of your birds. I'd say it almost every week. So, um, so yeah, you just keep it fresh. Make sure, I would say it depends on the heat. Uh, it depends on if it gets a lot of direct sun. Um, you know, you're going to want to change it out pretty regularly. All right. Well, the, 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 the warblers, this is a yellow warbler. Um, they're, they're known as the butterflies of the bird world and uh, for bird watchers and people look forward every year uh, and if you're a bird watcher for the or the the warbler group to come moving through as well as the tanagers and the grosbeaks and the buntings all these beautiful birds but the group of the uh, birds the warbler group which are only in this hemisphere over here on this side of the planet and believe me uh, i've got friends that are bird watchers in england and they are so jealous of this group of birds. <laughs> when they come to uh, the bird here in America, believe me, they want to come in the spring because they want to see all these beautiful, tiny little insect-eating birds known as the warblers. So um, this is one of the most common warblers in, in urban areas. The yellow warbler is, uh, it, it, you know, like they love willows and around little ponds and things like that. But there are a tremendous variety of warblers. And I highly encourage you, we could definitely do a, a whole uh, program on nothing but warblers. Um, but now's the time to be out looking for them. We, again, we had, I think, five or six species this morning, which is still really low. Um, we There are some days that we can get upwards of 20 species of warblers in good habitat as they're passing through. A lot of them nest up in the, in the, uh, the boreal forest of Canada and the northern reaches, but we have warblers that nest in the desert. We have nor warblers who nest in prairies. We have warblers who nest, they fill niches in different habitats. So depending on where you live, uh, but during migration, they could be anywhere because they're eating bugs, fattening up to keep their journey going further north. So highly encourage you to, to uh, research the and look into the, the warbler group up there. So, and then a bird uh, that we, I, we covered uh, it's already added the, the wood thrush. The thrushes are, you know, the beautiful songsters. Most of them are ground level birds um, and low brush, low brushy areas. Um, but we, they're, they're just beautiful songsters. We, you know, thrushes also include bluebirds and thrushes include um, the, it, it, several species in this group and then mimic thrushes, which of course are the cat birds and the mockingbirds and all that. So they're known for their songs. Um, and so this is a bird that you just love to hear. Um, but they get a chance to see them. They're kind of secretive, and they you, you 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 really celebrate when you do see them, especially when they're leading a bird hike like I do. And when we get a wood thrush out in the open, people love it. So uh, here is yet another of the warblers. This guy is known as a black burning in warbler. The the nickname for this bird is Old Fire Throat. We call him. His, his throat is just an unbelievable yellow, orange, just super rich colored bird. And they uh, live in the tops of oak trees. And, they, and getting this bird this close for this shot was very, very lucky because usually they're really high up in the trees and when you see them. So um, that, uh, just another example of why migration is so special and, and now encouraging you to get out right now in the next two weeks, especially in this region, and then you guys uh, up north, they're coming toward your way, and so you've got a little more extended time, and a lot of these birds nest up your way, so 
Um, they're easiest to find when they're out in the open singing, trying to attract a mate. And that's early in the spring. So that's what, what you know, you want to be out there looking for them. So the warblers, uh, the thrushes, the tanagers, the buntings, uh, the grosbeaks, uh, the hummingbirds. I mean, this is, we've been, we've been without these guys all winter. So we're really excited to have them back in the area. So that, again, I wanted to talk about nesting and I want to talk about migration or my main topic. So I'm ready for questions, you know, promise question and answers. I hopefully you guys are uh, got some questions ready for me tonight. And I know I, I really appreciate you reporting what's going on in your area. You know, you guys are what you're seeing and hopefully, you know, what you're having. And I'm so hopeful that you're, you know, the migration gets cranked up here for sure. All right. Let's see. Have you ever heard of a very large barred owl taking down a blue jay? I, you know, uh, barred owls, they're pretty varied in their diets. I've never had them attack a blue jay. I, I don't doubt that they could take down a blue jay, uh, Steve, but they, uh, you know, they're, they mainly eat snakes and lizards. Uh, uh, barred owls also eat slow moving fish. Um, but one thing about owls, owls, will take advantage of anything they find sleeping on the roost, especially, and great horns will do this. Uh, again, I've told the story of great horned owls actually killing wild turkeys, which are bigger than them. But when the turkey is asleep on a limb at night and a great horned owl finds it, it usually got the surprise attack and get those talons in there and they can kill them. And then, of course, then they have to, to pull them apart. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised of uh, on taking down a, a blue jay, although it's just not typical you know, for them to do that. So um, I love my barred owls. If you don't know what a barred owl sounds like, you want me to do my barred owl call? It, I do. It They they are the who cooks for you, who cooks for you all, as what they say. And I goes, it goes, woo, 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 And that, it, 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 you can't mistake that owl call for anybody. Um, and we have them that nest right back in our woods right here. And I'll talk to them sometime. I'll do that. And they'll answer me in the backyard. So uh, we like the barred owls, although we have a little Bichon. Uh, and I don't like her out there by herself. Uh, the, the, whenever, you know, especially in the spring when the barred owls are very, very active. So we don't let her out in the yard at night by herself. So love the barred owls. All right. So they got an update on... Wow, he did have a large owl with a blue jay in his talons. Not sure speaks to a, we heard you know, down where you're at, Steve. Barred owls are definitely the most common owl. Um, the the great horned owls, which are larger, um, and of course they have the tufts uh, that look like ears, but they're not ears; they're just for show. Uh, and the barred owl is a rounded head and has dark eyes. Um, with the, and but either of those have certainly the size, the ability to, to uh, take a blue jay for sure. You would have to catch him off. Uh... Daryl said, "I'm not bad. Excellent, great. I have quite a compliment from your expert. Yep, yep. I've been practicing that barred owl for a long time. Yeah, I used to drive my roommates cr uh, crazy in college because I would do it a lot in the shower because it's got a good echo in there. And so when I was perfecting it, uh, uh, they, yeah, they, uh, they go quick." doing that. <laughs> so, all right. Jen says she's a new bird enthusiast. This is our first spring in our house. And I'm trying to attract birds like hummingbirds and orioles. Are there other types of birds that will uh, scare them away? You know, for the most part, hummingbirds are not afraid of other birds. Uh, they just know that they can outfly anything. Uh, more hummingbirds are more afraid of bees than anything because they they can act, they actually be outflown by a bee or a wasp. So, uh, but birds as a whole, hummingbirds just don't they, they pay much attention. You know, they they know they can zip around them, and so no, I would I would say not be scared there. But Orioles are a little timid at first. Now we're we're getting to that point where it's been forty years or so now that we've been feeding Orioles. So a lot of our Orioles are now used to bird feeders and other birds uh, when they come in, and so it used to be they were pretty shy. Uh, and they would be a little timid. And, and like if a blue jay flew in, the oriole would fly off really quickly and then come back. Um, but th that seems to be lessened now. I mean, they're, they're, they still come down, grab a quick bite of jelly and go. So you get that it, it coming and going with them, but not 
uh, I don't think, yeah, I think they're not nearly as skittish as they used to be. So I wouldn't have a lot of fear there. Hi, Brian. Brian's joining in us from, from Leavenworth, Kansas. And he was on the bird hike today. And you, and you're right. Uh, he's asking about the sparrows. We had very few um, uh, native sparrows. And so a lot of what's going on is the, 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 our winter sparrows, our white crown sparrows, white throated sparrows, and uh, white crowns that, that, that speed hair sparrows, those guys are pulling out and, and going to their breeding grounds up north. Uh, we have chipping sparrows in, which has spent the winter to the south. So we're getting those in, and we heard one of those today. But the, the, the sparrows are in transition, and we had a okay winter for the native sparrows, but uh, maybe not, not a great one. So I think that's part of it, Brian, is that they're we got some pulling out and we got a few that are arriving. And so we're still in that, that migration pattern there for those guys. And we'll lose all summer. We won't have a lot of the ones where we've seen this winter and we, especially the ones we've seen this spring, the Vesper sparrows and, and some of those guys, they move on and, and nest further north. Excuse me. David's owl call. Did you, that's right. How, how about another owl call? Uh, that little screech owl that we showed in the box there, uh, this guy, uh, I, I think the, the, uh, the name of this bird automatically makes people think that they make a loud screeching sound, but they don't. <laughs> they, they, I think a better name, if you want to name it after his call, would have been a quiver owl. Um, they go. And I remember growing up that, that that there was a saying that when you hear a screech owl suddenly in the night, it means there's been a death in your family. Um, of course, I never believed that. And I know that's not true, but that is something that's attached to the sound of that bird is that, that but uh, they are, uh, they are, they have to be very careful because they will get eaten by barred owls and great horned owls um, in their areas. Uh, and, and they, so when you're that small, you kind of have to be pretty secretive and be careful um, that's one of the reasons why uh, screech owls are, are the most common urban nesting owl. Um, and then that is the, because they're getting away from predators. Uh, great horns tend not to nest in, in urban settings. And so we have screech owls nesting in cities, you know, in, in the little patches of woods where um, the, uh, you can find a, my, a story I tell from college is I had a, a guy, I worked for a guy who worked on an owl study one day they, where they put tracking uh, telemetry equipment on owls and followed them around. And he was following this little screech owl one night as his signal. And he, it pulled, it, it was coming from a garage uh, in an urban area. So he pulled off and he walked over and the, the garage door was open and there was a man inside working on a table saw. And he walked in and he had his equipment on and everything. And he said, you know, introduced himself and he was working for the, I think it was Virginia Tech University at the time. And he said, you know, have you seen an owl? Um, and, and he said, no, I've been in here working on this wood all night. And they looked up and the little screech owl was sitting up in the rafter in the garage while the guy was there working on the table saw, sawing wood. And that little screech owl was just happy as he could be up there. So uh, they they're actually uh, can be quite brave for those little guys. So, all right. You mentioned blue jay nesting boxes earlier. And is it too late? You can put one. No, blue jays don't nest in cavities. They're not. They're not box nesters. Uh, they're platform nesters. Uh, David, they they nest on. Uh, they build really shambly um, the big nests. I do have a video on on the online of a blue jay that built a nest in a hanging basket on a friend's front porch. Uh, that she didn't have any plant in it. It was just the bedding in it. And so the blue jays nested in that. So they do nest and open, but not inside of any kind of cavity, unfortunately. All right, Bobby, the black chin hummingbird, a male I saw today, flew right up to the feeder while I was standing right next to it. And about changes. Yep. And, and they're not afraid of you, Bobby. That's right. I, I've, I've actually gone out, put the, picked the hummingbird feeder off of the hook, turned to walk inside with it and had the ruby throat come up and feed out of it while I was sitting there holding it before I could take it inside. So yeah, yeah they're I, the hummingbirds are incredibly brave little birds. Like I said, I think it's their confidence and their ability. We know, you know, they're the only bird that we know can fly backwards and then we only know that we can actually fly up. So it can fly any direction. Uh, and they're, so they're just highly maneuverable. 
Teresa Grammer, Eudora, Kansas. All right. I saw my first indigo bunting today. Good. That's good. He's right. She's right. You know, Teresa, you're right there. Just beautiful little birds. Oh, absolutely. You funny. You said Ruth asking about, have you heard about any whippoorwills? Uh, a, a couple on our hike this morning said they had a whippoorwill on their porch yesterday, last night. It was calling and it was sitting on this porch railing. And he tried to go get his camera. When it came back, it, it flew off. So, yes, whippoorwills are on the move as well, coming through the area. We don't have many that nest in this part of Missouri. Uh, they are more of a northern nest. There's a few nests in, in mid-Missouri. Um, but, yeah, they that was the first report I've had of a whippoorwill this year. You Funny you ask that. It's true. I meant, yeah, oh, David, I meant, is it a good time for a Blue Jay platform? Yes. Uh, yeah, the Blue Jays, a lot of Blue Jays are already, uh, for you guys, my guess is now is, is, is when they're really looking for nesting. Here, ours are probably in um, in in the midst of the nesting right now. So um, it, it, I would think up in, in, in that Rhode Island, Northeastern per se, you still have time to put up, you know, maybe some kind of a nesting platform like that. Um, like I said, it, it, it you can build the, the the greatest nesting boxes and platforms for birds and they'll nest in a old pair of shoes or they'll nest on a, uh, a in a hanging basket on your on your porch or uh, a, a grapevine wreath on your front door it, it, it's it's really tough you know they and you go okay well as long as they nest but you you would like them to nest where uh, you know you put some effort into building something for them that's for sure all right Ruth says she's had Harris sparrows and white crown sparrows. Uh, and that's and they are beautiful right now. Those are two of the native sparrows that Brian was talking about earlier. Um, the white crown Harris and Harris sparrows are both related to the white throated sparrows. And I have a like I said, I've got a whole program on the native sparrows that uh, I've done, um, and they they are beautiful birds, and they're getting ready to leave. So you, you, you take advantage, and they're so pretty right now because they're in full. Uh, breeding uh, plumage right now, and they're getting ready to head north to their breeding grounds. So Harris's and white crowns are two sparrows to enjoy during migration for sure. Oh gosh, we talk about starlings. Ah! Yeah, the upside down suet feeders are a good way to discourage starlings, but they are in by no means starling proof. Um, they again we. You want them to have to hang upside down to get to it, and it slows them down. But some are better than others at figuring out, you know, how to get them. Uh, and again, mentioned that that they're not protected, <laughs> so the starlings can be a real, real issue. Um, but the, yeah, if they have figured out the upside down feeders, uh, and then your next, uh, really, your next option are caged feeders. You know, putting your suet feeders inside of a um, a, a, a cage and we have cages that fit uh, feeders, you know, you can hang a, a, a soot feeder in there. And yes, those cage feeders do keep out the red bellies and the, and flickers. Um, but the downies, chickadees, titmice, all those guys can get into the suet, but the starlings can't. So they're, it, it, you know, you just have to keep up the good fight when it comes to starlings and suet. Yeah, yeah. Some of them, you know, birds adapt, you know, and unfortunately the, the start, the upside down starting feeder, uh, proof feeders used to be, the bomb. Um, it just the longer we have them out, and the more ingenuity they 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 can figure it out. Absolutely. All right, and it, it, goldfinches again. They're almost completely now in our area molted into their wild canary. Uh, the male, the wild canary plumage, uh, but they're not going to nest yet. They, they remember, they're they're our last nesting songbird. Don't start until July in our area. But uh, they're coming and going. And I did post a video, I think, last week or so about why do they suddenly disappear when the dandelions bloom? They go out there and take advantage of that. When the red maple little helicopter seeds start to fall, they go take advantage of that. And that's going to happen with goldfinches right now for the next few weeks and until uh, they go out and nest and not until July. So you'll see them coming and going. Uh, they're just not going to be as consistent uh, now that some natural food supplies are getting becoming available for them. Well, thank Dave. Yep, and he says uh, thank you so much. Thank you. I said if you guys 
please don't forget to click the likes and uh, and that, that helps me out a lot. The thumbs up um, that helps uh, you right with the uh, what do they call the the algorithms and that kind of stuff, so that YouTube uh, will will promote my videos and, and let, make more people find us, which is a wonderful thing. So, and thank you guys for the support of the, the online store. Um, if you if you haven't subscribed or uh, liked our our uh, Facebook page, and that's just search by uh, search Facebook for Mark at I mean at uh, Backyard Bird Center, and it'll come up. And we have a lot, you know, I'm, I'm posting stuff on there just about every day. So if you like that, and for more information, you can always send me questions. I know some of you guys have been sending in uh, the. Um, the, uh, the questions to me directly as a store. We love it. Uh, I got pictures, you know, identify bird. We call it name that bird. When people send me pictures of their feeders, they, they want clarification and those are fun to help with. So always glad to help out. Let's see. Steve, thank you. And he says to the McKellar family, great presentation. Thank you guys. <laughs> yeah. <Steve Robert. laughs> Dave, thank you for the proof. Thank you for the kind words. And Dave, who uh, is alias or KFKF Dave, uh, that might be a radio station, right, Dave? All right. Thank you so much for your time and sharing your knowledge. I look for, excellent, excellent. Thank you, Bobby. I, that that is always appreciated. Uh, people uh, can chime in and and uh, make a. I don't know what those are called, but they're well, they're wonderful. They help us out. Um, Definitely uh, I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Again, never hesitate to to send me ideas. If you there's a topic you want me to talk about, we'd love to do it. I mean, I, I I've got some stuff planned out um, over the next uh, couple months, and we can always slip new ones in. And um, oh, by the way, for you bluebird people, you've been asking about this. Uh, this Saturday on on Facebook, I'm going to do a demonstration on how to install the fishing line on bluebird boxes to try to help uh, discourage the house sparrows. And then that will be on YouTube next Monday night. So we're going to do the, do a film it on Saturday uh, live on Facebook, and then I'll post it uh, uh, on next Monday night on YouTube. So hope you got, that'll help you out. Like I said, I've been asked about that. Um, we used to put it on all our bluebird boxes uh, and we, we, we it's easy to do. And I can you know, show you how to do that. And hopefully that'll help some of you people, but remember, if the box has already been discovered by the house sparrows, it tends not to be effective. It has to be kind of a new box and a new new location. Super chats. That's it. Thank you, Bobby. Uh, the name was just escaping me there as to what that's called. Absolutely. They help out a lot. All right. Dave had his first Oriole yesterday. Good. Yeah, Dave, uh, excellent. So yes, let me know. I mean, again, just send, shoot me an email, mark at backyardbirdcenter.com or info is down in the description below. Um, and uh, you can always get in contact me, with me and, and uh, we will uh, try to answer any questions you have on there. And then again, we, uh, suggestions, will you ask questions and people online that want to know about it, we can do programs. So that's awesome. Again, thank you so much, guys. Yeah, absolutely, Carol. Thank you. For tuning in and uh, we will be back live on here in two, two weeks to on Thursday, two weeks from now, but we'll have some videos. I'll be posting here over the next, next couple of weeks in time too. So thanks so much guys. Have a good night. <laughs>